Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 4th of September of 2020, and the article that I'm going to be breaking apart today was published on the 24th of August of 2020. And I really need to tip my hat off to Dr. Jose Dionisio Torres Jr., a.k.a. And this is his handle, Sangria Loving Airway Doc. Love it, my friend. He's an ER doctor who he and I chat a bunch. Um, And I really got to tip my hat because he sent me this article this morning, which really caught my eye. Allow me to start off with a disclaimer. If you've been following any of my work, you already know that I favor cheap and readily, readily available therapies over expensive therapeutics. There has been a lot of talk about vitamin D and its relationship to patients affected with COVID-19. Honestly, a little bit too much for me to get into for the sake of this podcast. We'll be here for about half an hour or so. And honestly, I don't think we have time for that. It seems as if there's something new every single day. What we lack, though, is a body of evidence of any kind that looks at whether supplementing vitamin D in COVID patients is beneficial and actually improves outcomes. Fortunately, this pilot study, which if I try to read the name of the whole entire study, we're going to be here for about 15 minutes. This pilot study was published that gives us some insight. And it's actually, as I mentioned before, a pilot study, which I'm going to break down what exactly that means. But this pilot study gives us an inclination of sorts of what we're going to see in the actual multi-center randomized control trial that is ongoing right now in Spain. First of all, I want to teach you all about something called impact factor. I'm really not trying to be a snob here, but I've been digging around a number of different medical journals for the last several years, creating my uh, my Instagram, my YouTube, all, the, all my different sources of information and other social media ventures. If you've been around the block a couple times reading all these journals, you start learning about the heavy hitters in evidence-based medicine. These include journals such as The Lancet, The New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, You know, things that have impact factors over 50, for example. Impact factor is kind of a ranking of sorts that has many limitations, but generally speaking, the higher the impact factor, the better. That doesn't mean, though, that these journals are perfect, given that both the New England Journal of Medicine as well as The Lancet have published a couple turd sandwiches this year. But overall, it gives you a general idea. When it came to today's journal post or journal article, a red flag honestly came into my head when I was reading the title of the actual journal, which is the Journal of Steroid Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. To be quite frank with you, I had never heard of this journal. Chances are you haven't either. Then I looked them up and it turns out they have an impact factor of 3.8, which by no means is it the best, but it's also not the worst. Just to give you an inclination, for example, CHEST as well as a Society of Critical Care Medicine's journal they're an impact factor around 8, 9, 10, around there. So it's not up to par, but again, there's been worse. This also pub- possibly means that they tried to get this pilot study published in other journals and they were denied. Again, I could be completely wrong about that. The next thing I wanted to define for you all is what exactly a pilot study is, because it's something that's mentioned throughout the whole entire article. And if you're somebody who's going to want to get into reading all these articles, it's something you need to know. A pilot study is a study that is used to assess whether a particular study can actually be completed. It's not designed to give you any sure thing answer. It's not designed, it's not powered appropriately to show a cure or a benefit necessarily. The sample sizes are usually smaller. The methodology is usually a little bit different or, you know, they're just trying to figure out if it could work or not. They're testing the architecture for larger clinical trials. In other words, They're asking, can we actually pull off a larger study about whatever they're looking at in the form that they did the pilot study? And perhaps this may be the reason why it was published in said journal with such a low impact factor. And what I always say around this time in the podcast is that you should read the article for yourself. I tend to pick articles that you could download for yourself for free without doing all this uh, all this paying for articles and whatnot. So please read it for yourself and don't trust me. So let's see what they actually did for these patients with regards to the vitamin D as well as other therapies provided. So the type of vitamin D that they gave was the 25-hydroxyvitamin D3. This was provided orally in capsules of 0.532 milligrams on day one, followed by 0.266 milligrams on day three and seven until discharge or ICU admission. 
they went ahead and enrolled 76 consecutive patients. All the patients who were in the study, just as an aside, also received hydroxychloroquine as well as azithromycin. There's no mention as to what the dates were when the study took place, because that would help us understand a little bit more about what was standard of care at that time. There's also no mention whatsoever of glucocorticoids, so I bet that this was done before the recovery trial. And then when you're looking at the patients to whom it was given to, vitamin D was provided compared to the controls in a two to one ratio. Anytime that you're looking at these studies, whether it's a pilot study or any type of study for that matter, you need to take a quick look at the patients who are enrolled because the patients should be similar in both arms of the trial. This is where we need to remember that this is a pilot study and what that actually means. And it turns out that the two groups were not as evenly matched as we would want them to be in an actual trial. An example of this is that there were more patients with with hypertension in the control group. In addition, although these weren't statistically significant, there was also a trend towards a higher D-dimer in the control group, as well as a trend for more diabetics as well in the control group. So that means that this could lead to worse outcomes. But let's take a look at the effects of vitamin D supplementation in these patients who had COVID and what they actually found. And it turns out that out of the 26 patients in the control arm, 50% of the patients, in other words, 13, required admission to the ICU. And out of the patients who were in the treatment arm, which were 50 patients, only one of those patients required ICU admission, which is pretty outstanding. It's pretty crazy to think of that. This could be the difference. But the authors went ahead and said, you know, let's hold our horses here. Let's not call this a cure. Let's not, let's wait for the randomized control trial because we need to wait for more evidence. Thankfully, the Spaniards are hard at work with a multi-center randomized control trial to give us a more concrete answer of what we should do and how we should take care of our COVID patients. Let's wrap up this podcast. I am not stating at this time, on this date, that we need to put vitamin D in the water. We should put it in the sun though, right? Obviously, that's a joke. But this pilot study, as noted by the authors, has several limitations because it is, quote, not a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. There are many things that they should have done that they admit that they did not do, like check, for example, serum vitamin D levels at baseline. They also did not include a comparison with cholecalciferol, which is the native vitamin D3 form and nutritional substrate for calcifidiol. So they cannot conclude that calcifidiol is superior to vitamin D itself. I am by no means a vitamin D metabolism expert, so I suggest you look this up for yourself rather than ask me all about it. More than anything, this podcast was just to stimulate your thought a little bit, give you something new to think about, hopefully some hope uh, that we might have a treatment that's cheap, readily available, as well as accessible that could potentially help out our patients who are unfortunately suffering from COVID-19. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you for your support. Thank you for giving thumbs up and, you know, sharing my work with your friends because it helps the channel and the podcast grow, which is greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. Bye.